Oh yeah, um, if you can make room up there, maybe that's best. Uh, do you need another chair? Do we need to pull another chair? And uh, we're going to continue with Acts. We we're made it through the first about four, three chapters, four chapters, and you won't miss much. We'll, we'll you'll pick up right away. Um, the study, the book we use for the study is the Bible. So bring your uh, favorite version of the Bible. If you don't have a Bible, there are some Bibles over there uh, that we can get. And uh, if you're joining us online, um, pick up a Bible in your house. And if you don't have a Bible in your house, uh, well, let us know. I've got plenty of Bibles in my office. I'd be glad to give to you. <laughs> there are also, yeah, you can get a Bible app on your phone if you have a smartphone. Yeah. So, uh, well, let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, I uh, give you thanks, oh God, for this opportunity to study your word together. We pray that you would illumine our lives and our hearts, uh, that you would bless us with our fellowship and, and our fellowship with you in the spirit. And we ask all these things and many more in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> So Peter and John before the council. We're going to start in chapter four. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came to them, much annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming that in Jesus there is the resurrection of the dead. So they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the word believed, and they numbered about 5,000. The next day, their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family, and Alexander, and all who were of when they had made the prisoner stand in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name do you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who is sick and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the, build, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. 
So here's Peter appearing before the, the Sanhedrin. This is what the council is called. And they're primarily composed of chief priests and other priests. And they were of a party known as the Sadducees. We talked a little bit about the Sadducees last week. And their desire was to keep the status quo. You know, when there's disruption, they don't like it. How many of you, regardless in your workplace or church life, other places, met folks that they did not like disruption? Don't change. Don't change things. <laughs> you met some folks like that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they, they enjoy the status quo. They benefit from it. And, uh, you know, you can kind of see this sometimes when I serve in the National Guard, when there's a change in the, the battalion commander or the, the commanding officer at a company level that uh, everybody gets really nervous and they're like on their toes because there's going to be change. And some people don't make it. They ended up transferring out or going someplace else disgruntled because they liked the way things were. And now there's a new person in town, things change. And that's, that's difficult. So here is a change brought about. We may say, oh, well, is it Peter and John bringing this change? But no, who is bringing this change? Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ through, the Holy, through his spirit. The Holy Spirit is at work bringing this change about. Um, so um, this can happen even in, in churches. Uh, you know, there's um, kind of an analogy might, my dad was a chair of operations for a church uh, when growing up in Miami. It was a Presbyterian church. So he was an elder on the session. That was kind of like being a trustee in a Methodist church. But in any event, he oversaw the operation. And there was a school that was run across the street for preschoolers. And there was a warehouse. And it turned out that they had a workshop there for years, woodworking and also ceramic, a kiln. With ceramics. Well, anybody who knows anything about ceramics knows that you're also dealing with uh, the gl lead glaze, and that really the, the the workshop for ceramics should not have been cl so close to the preschool. So finally, uh, DCF had come and done an inspection, and they cited this, and they said you really need to get rid of this workshop. So they did, and since they had been doing it for so long. Uh, my dad was the one tasked with the unpleasant job of pulling, you know, undoing the bolts of the kilns and, and hauling them off. And the ladies were so upset, you know, they had had this ministry for years doing this. And, uh, it, you know, they said, you know, they told, they talked to my dad and they said, you know, you're pretty awful for doing this. How dare, how dare you do this? You are like the devil incarnate, you know, and, and said, he said, well, I, I'm sorry, but Man, we're we're a church. We're a church. We we are a church, and um, we. Oh, sorry. Uh, we're a church, and we're all about you know doing what's right for the children, and we all follow. We're all on the same side, following Jesus Christ. And the lady said to him, "You leave him out of it." Well, I always thought that was an amazing story when my. When my dad told me, it's like, you leave them out of it. And to me, that's like a microcosm of what sometimes occurs in the life of the church is that people will, you know, start doing their thing and they get involved in it and they like it. It's the status quo. And then God brings up about some change. And then people sometimes in the church will say, you leave them out of it. And if you leave Jesus out of it, you're leaving the whole point of, of, of being a church because God has brought us together for that for that work. Um, so it's kind of a story that's always uh, stuck with me. And we could easily look at the Sadducees and chief priests and, and pour, pile it on, on them and say, we would have done differently. But how many of us would, would have done this? You know, if we're comfortable with the status quo, change is hard for all kinds of people. So here's a, wind, a whole wind of change. Um, and think about some of the things that, Peter is preaching in this moment. Um, first of all, we know that this person has been healed. Okay, healings can happen. 
Um, it, uh, and then they say this, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, with you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. So there's a couple things here. The Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection of the dead, as we know it. Um, they look into the Torah, and they see very little mention of the afterlife, except for Sheol. So whatever Sheol is, the bosom of Abraham, they do not believe in the physical resurrection from the dead. Uh, it doesn't mean that they don't believe that, that you know, there's some type of afterlife, but basically the fate of all souls is to go to Sheol. That's what that's what it says. There's not much more imagination or revelation for them. What they do about Elijah? Yeah, I know that's the that's the challenge. You know, um, exactly. Or or other visions that Ezekiel has or yeah. Daniel had of the Son of Man in heaven and coming in glory. I don't know. So that, that's where that debate comes about. And they say, well, the first five books of the Torah are the most important. Well, the Pharisees, you know, were equally adept at looking at scripture. And they they said, no, there is a resurrection of the dead. It says it in scripture. So, you know, that also indicates something that we struggle with now is that two different people could read the same Bible, but come away with two very different interpretations of something, you know. So, and, ten, and ten people would have ten. ten <laughs> and, 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 and today, people pick and choose what they want to believe. Right. Yeah. So the, the Acts kind of gives an indication of <clears throat> it's not about who's right and who's wrong. It's about who's following the Spirit. And you can see Peter and John are on the side of the Holy Spirit. Right? And Jesus been raised from the dead, but then also that uh, he uh, is, there is no one else for there is no one under heaven given among morals by which we must be saved. So there's two, and making this affirmation, making this confession, that there's no other name by which we could be saved. There's two things going on here. You're going to upset the chief priests. Who, there is only one God and you're, own, you're equating Jesus with a deity divine being by saying that he can save us and then you're going to upset the romans because the savior of the world is the emperor so you know they're making a claim here that has a heavenly uh dimension and an earthly dimension there's no mistaking here and they're staking their life on it uh <clears throat> you know and, and so let's continue a little bit to see what they say. Uh, verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and ordinary men, they were amazed and recognized them as companions of Jesus. When they saw the man who had been cured standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. So they ordered them to leave the council while they discussed the matter with one another. They said, what will we do with them? For it is obvious to all who live in Jerusalem that a notable sign has been done through them. We cannot deny it. But to keep it from spreading further among the people, let us, uh, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in, his name, in this name. So they called them and ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in God's side to listen to you rather than to God, you must be the judge. But we cannot keep from speaking about what we have seen and heard. After threatening them again, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all of them praised God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing had been performed was more than 40 years old. Mind you, you know, 40 years old then is different than 40 years old now. <laughs> you know, with the life expectancy of people is... It's much different. Somebody in their 60s or something, you know. Uh, any thoughts that you all have on the boldness of Peter in his proclamation? He must have been a Jewish man. Pretty bold. Mm -hmm. Stand in front of them and have them believe him. That's amazing. Peter learned his lesson, though. I think mm -hmm. when he followed Jesus, he learned his lesson. Yes. 
He learned his lesson uh, about being bold from Jesus. And he learned that. He learned to speak and when not to speak and mm -hmm. how, to, how to follow the Spirit. And he knows what happens when you don't. You know, he's been on the other. Jesus challenged him. And when he proclaimed he loved him, he met. Right. Him. Peter denied Jesus three times, right? Well, he, so. well, he, he has walked the road against him and he's not good. Yeah, he knows what it means when you withhold or you hide or and the shame that comes with that. And he never wants to be in that place again. You know, you feel if you are a Christian and you and you know you say that you're not, you know, you're a divided mind, you're divided self. And at some point you feel like you have an identity crisis. And also you must feel as if um you've let God down. I mean, I can't imagine what Peter felt like. You know, on that moment when the cock crowed, he realized he had denied Jesus three times. So here was another chance to answer the questions, and he wasn't going to back down at this point. Well, you know, I had an experience uh, where I had boldness. I was preaching in Cook County Jail when I was about 21 years old in Chicago. And uh, Afterwards, the uh, Moody guys that were there said, you, you should have given an invitation. And, uh, you know, I wasn't trained to preach or anything, mm. but God must have just used what I said from his word. Absolutely. And uh, so I'll never forget that. And wow. I, I think we should never be afraid to stand up for the Lord no matter what. Yes. Amen. Plus they also say here that the spirit led what to say and angry people knew that they weren't educated. I yes. think that's a big convincing fact for the Pharisees. Right. And they speak with such eloquence even without being necessarily educated, you know. Mm -hmm. I think that um, the uh, ones he was talking to called themselves in a very difficult conflict. Their job is to keep the people from being so raw about some things. And this obviously was rolling them up. And they they uh, didn't want to encourage the people to continue to do that. Like, well, they thought, well, if they just shut you up and go away, we can kind of bring it under control. Yeah. That didn't work either. But uh, that's I think I think that's what their response was. They would it wasn't so much that they wanted to disbelieve or believe Jesus is God's from the grave. They just didn't want the thing to get out of hand because if it did, they were in trouble with their authorities. <laughs> right. Yeah, they didn't have they they were being watched by the Romans clearly. And if it were to get too out of hand, the Romans would take over and would probably shut the temple down right. or desecrate it. Which they did eventually anyway. Which they did eventually anyway. Yeah. Yeah. They I mean, history had taught them that this is what occupiers will eventually do. You know, the temple, Especially the Romans, the Romans, yeah. Mm -hmm. What do they call it? Uh, Pax, Pax, uh, Pax, Pax Romana, Pax, yeah, the Roman peace, peace, Roman peace, which Roman really peace. wasn't you peace. Do what I want, or you're out of peace. I'm not making peace. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> And then the power of the people, though, also becomes something that I think, uh, you know, we should witness, too. If people come together with belief, uh, it doesn't matter the, the, the might. It doesn't matter the, I, I would say, you know, if you have the bullets or the money or, the, you know, if you have the belief and you have, you know, you're together for a cause, you have more power than you realize. And the Sadducees knew this about Peter and John. They had the people on their side in Jerusalem, you know, so they didn't, it was just like the same thing. They didn't, they arrested Jesus by night because had they arrested him during the day when there were crowds, it would have been a riot. It would have been a different story. Yeah. Um, so verse 23, we'll continue. Uh, after they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard it, they raised their voice together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything in them. 
It is you who said by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant. Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood there, took their stand, and the rulers have gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. For in this city, in fact, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look at their threats and grant to your servants to speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed throughout the name of your holy servant Jesus. When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. Hmm. So it's not just Peter and John, it's all the believers. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you know, as David had shared earlier, you, you speak with boldness. You know, you somehow have the words that you need and the courage. Um, so how do you receive the Spirit? I think part of it, what we talked about, is, is coming together in community. This is so important, what you all are doing together, studying God's Word together. We could study it on our own, but there's something you know, powerful that the Spirit does when we come together and study it together. There's encouragement uh, for us believers. You're building up the body. The other thing that you notice is that they pray, they pray together. You know, this is a part of coming together and praying together. We pray together in our study, but I'm kind of wondering when they gather together, how how long did they pray together? You know, we might imagine that it okay, maybe it was a 10 or 15 minute prayer time. What if it was longer than that? You know, how would have you ever been to a prayer service that you thought, oh, this is powerful, but this is going on for a long time? Bible. Revivals, right? Yeah. And, they, they, you know, you're wondering, oh, boy, it's really late. Mm -hmm. Billy Graham, that song over and over, over, and over again. again. Until as many people as possible came forward to the altar call. Yeah. Because they knew it took some people a long time to let out. Right. What are some of the barriers that we have to, you know, taking this kind of time to pray? In community, what are some of the things that create those football games? But other <laughs> obligations, other distractions, but football games. Dinner's ready. <laughs> dinners. There's there's other demands of the home, of life, physical needs, workplace. Mm -hmm. You have to open yourself up if you're going to pray in the spirit. Work you have to open yourself up, and that's scary. Yeah. Well, the expectations that we have been given for how many years that church service is about an hour. Right. Mm -hmm. Church <laughs> service yeah. is an hour. When we meet here, like on Sunday, David will say, Well, oh, he's keeping them longer there at the Baptist church. <laughs> and I said, Well, they do things different. You know, they yeah. do have prayer, you know, come down. And I said, Yeah, the altar call. The Holy Spirit is there. Yes. They won't leave right away. You know? Yeah. But yeah. So, uh, he was raised Methodist. I was raised Methodist. Mm. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Maybe if the ground shook like it did here and so many other times after we prayed, <laughs> I feel serious about it. Mm. <laughs> Maybe in California. I don't know. But. Right. <laughs> but yeah, if your prayers all of a sudden the ground was shaking, like in so many of these instances, I think it would hit home. It's how, and I know Sandy and, or Shirley and some of us are in. Um, prayer group and we often by the time we walk out the door we're getting a text that the prayers that we've been praying have been answered already for people we prayed for that's wonderful and about an hour i guess and uh, it's just it's amazing uh, it's amazing to me and i never had doubted the power of the prayers yes yeah. now that being said there could be there's nothing no mention of time so i'm no. just inferring here there could be uh you know, sometimes where people take way too much time and, you know, they're just, you know, they, you lose focus. You lose, yeah, you lose focus. I mean, 
so, right fall asleep right so i i think it's it's a balance you know um but you have to live in the spirit i think that's the that's the key indication here and but they had a sense of urgency there was less distractions um when you you know got nowhere to look but up you know your your hope and you depend more on god for your provision for your protection when you know that any moment you could be taken and put into prison and pulled in front of the, the council or put in prison, like Peter and John, you know, almost were, you have a different perspective. You know, you learn to depend on God in each moment. So I think that's what you see here. And yet, um, you know, God makes his presence known. So go ahead, Dennis. Um, in 1970, at uh, Asbury College, they had a revival breakout in chapel service during the week. And I think it went probably two weeks, maybe even a little longer before they even had class again. Wow. You know, the clock, 24 hours a day. Yeah. People sharing what God was doing in their lives mm -hmm. and singing him to somebody else who plays. It's very interesting to go. We went one time at Prayer Clock. Just to see what was going on. An amazing experience to see that ongoing work in the people It seemed to get stale and dry. Yeah, I remember that. I remember that. I remember that. I remember that. I just let the spirit move them. That's one. Like you said, there was a, I don't want to say opposition, but the accrediting agency the school said he's gone long enough. And they said the answer back I thought was very interesting. Who let God decide that? And they went beyond what the accrediting agency said they could do. Fortunately, they didn't suffer any consequences. Right. Well, one one way that you know we, we might practically incorporate that is to take to, to surround our day with prayer. You know, you might not just do just a morning prayer. You might have morning, midday prayer, and evening prayer. You know, certainly you can have patterns to where you know you could have prayer. And if you're time conscious, um, there's nothing saying that you have to the the length of prayer. It's the Quality, not necessarily the quantity of time that, that you spend in prayer. Uh, so just a thought about that right there. Um, now here's interesting. They sharing their life together. They're praying together. Now, what do you think about them sharing their possessions? Well, that's, this is interesting. So let's continue in verse 32. I'm sure we're going to have some good debate about this one here. Uh, uh, now the whole group of those who believe were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions. But everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned land or houses sold them and bought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. There was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him, then brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Yeah, so this Barnabas is the same Barnabas of Paul and Barnabas of the first missionary journey. Okay. Um... Yeah, I've got the New English, and and they said that Barnabas means son of exhortation. Exhortation it means encouragement, but it means to it's a type of double encouragement. You encourage people to do something, and you also encourage them to refrain from something. Oh, okay. So you you exhort them is to mean to mm -hmm. encourage them to good works, but also to correct them at the same time. It's a kind of you know, okay. you know, therefore let us, mm -hmm. it's a, 
even you would see it in a certain way, uh, the verb phrase, when they knew that you were moving toward exhortation, uh, it would be um, an imperative form of the verb, like, you know, therefore, let us, you know, you see the Apostle Paul use this kind of language all the time, let us move, you know, on to perfection or salvation, you know, let us throw off, like as a preacher of Hebrews, let us throw off everything that encumbers us and follow, you know, Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, you know, Hebrews chapter two. So, uh, son of encouragement, son of exhortation, he was a mentor to Paul. Uh, this is where his faith journey starts. Um, now, that being said, I feel there's a couple things that we should put in perspective here. Uh, when when something is new, like the revival at Asbury, it's exciting. And when it's exciting, you tend to dive into things without abandon, without, there's not necessarily the institutional church. Um, but what you can actually see is as you read further, and even in Acts, as you read further in the epistles, is that conflict begins to emerge. So yes, things were rosy and sunny at first, but that sense of community was like a Camelot for a place and time that was beautiful and pristine. But it wasn't, it wasn't meant to be always lasting long. It was kind of a being in the garden, you know, and then there was human beings being human beings and it, it would fall apart eventually. But do you think that perhaps maybe look, Luke is looking back with some sense of nostalgia when he's, you know, sharing this, writing this? Dare I say it? I think God gives all true believers uh, a time to just feel his presence. Mm -hmm. And then like to say for him, are you going to follow the out of his heart? Yeah. Sort of like a marriage honeymoon. And then mm -hmm. the same after that. And skip down to the right. But I think God will give you what you need to find. But sooner or later, he'll expect you to grow. Yeah. You know, and there's an emphasis on the communal life together. Um, but as you can see in Paul's letters, what was happening is that people were expecting Jesus to come back any day now. Like theirs was a, a, a expectation that he would come back tomorrow, like the next day. And so if Jesus is coming back tomorrow, you have a different perspective on should I work? Should I own property? And so a lot of them were giving up their lives and coming in together because they were preparing for the second coming at any moment. Um, but when it didn't happen, what happened is that you had some people acting like the second coming was coming and they were living off people who were, who kept working and, and doing things. So eventually at some point this fell apart for the early church because some would li were living off the backs of people who were continuing to work and live in the world and engage in the world. So there was, there did conflict in emerge, but it was nice about Boston. Paul even said if they don't work, they don't eat. Right. Yeah. Because of this this thing. So where you can see this um, upheld in Christian community throughout the ages is in like monastic movements. For example, like the monasteries, people will still, you know, come together and they don't own any of their own property. Um, so everything is owned by the monastery and they do all do some of the, each, they split up the chores and some of do the, you know, they farm their own food depending on the kind of monastery they have. Um, but this, so there are still ways that this is put into practice. But I think that in, in religious circles, there are ways that this kind of living, unfortunately, can be abused. You know, you see this with sometimes with cults or a certain sects of branches of Christianity that have emerged that you know, strip people of their identity, their livelihood. And so what makes this communal living healthy and, and the difference when it becomes unhealthy? What do you think might be some ways when it's done right that differentiate it from when it's a, of exploitation or abuse or use, or used? Any thoughts on that? You know, like what would set a monastery apart from like, you know, some Mormon cult in the, I mean, Obviously, their beliefs are very different. 
but what might send set them apart from things? Strict rules and discipline. Well, they both have strict rules and discipline, but uh, there's a freedom. I think I'm going to give away the answer. There, <laughs> there, there's a freedom to come or go and say, if I don't want to be a part of this, I'm not. I don't have to be a part of this. There's no coercion. If you don't feel called to be a part of the monastery anymore, you come to the abbot and you say, I want to be released, and you're immediately released. You're given your freedom. There's no obligation to stay a part of the community. You know, it's a it's a choice of love and freedom. Whereas you're coerced and there's obligation and there is no freedom, then you know, then it becomes something else. It becomes a cult. So they they were just because they wanted to. Not I, 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 Andy. Yes, yes, yes. I, and that's what I would say is, is key to this, is there was a movement of the spirit that led them to do this of their own free will and volition, you know. That's why they did it. That's why they did it. Like even Joseph here, a part of that he didn't give and expect to be praised. He gave because he was led by the spirit. And yes. Like you said, we're going to see where that's not all. And there are yeah. people that will do things and they'll want their name to be known or something. We've been very blessed to know someone that had quite a bit of money. You wouldn't know to know him. Mm -hmm. They weren't. But every now and then, something came up and anonymously, there'd be a gift. Take care of it. And I'm sorry, I've never in my life carried around four thousand dollars. Never. And I know someone that, even when he was in the hospital, had a wallet full of money. And he was there and he listened to people. And, uh, he knew this one person and we're doing our time. And all of a sudden, there's this little, here's this money for you. And it's to be used as a sign. No one knew. And he didn't say it. We, we found out it was because of, I knew his wife. And she said, Oh, he does that all the time. Mm. And yet, if you looked at him, you'd never know he had money. Right. Uh, he bought every car with cash. And he went into the same dealership and bought a car. And the viewership, the man retired that worked with him went into our car and he was dressed in his work clothes. And the man said, Sir, we, we, I think you're in the wrong location. We really don't have any. And he, they just judged literally, him. he literally did not let him look around and said, well, I think you better leave. And the next day, when he knew someone would be there that knew him, he went in and he says, I'd like a car. And they said, Oh, okay. And the man stood there and opened his wallet, pulled out money and paid for it cash. But she looked at him and he thought he was. I mean, he was a laborer. Mm. He, he wanted to use what he was given, and he had a mind and hands and ability to do it, and he did it. Bless the bless others. Well, but that's what I mean. It's why are you doing? Yes. Well, let's get, let's continue um, here in verse one of chapter five. But a man named Ananias, with the consent of his wife. Sapphira sold a piece of property with his wife's knowledge. He kept back some of the proceeds and brought only a part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Ananias, Peter asked, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, were not the proceeds at your disposal? How is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You did not lie to us, but to God. Now, when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and died, and great fear seized all who heard it. The young man came and wrapped up his body, then carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter said to her, tell me whether you and your husband sold the land for such a price. And she said, yes, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Look at the feet of those who have buried your husband or at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and died. When the young man came and the founder dead, so they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear seized the whole church and all who heard of these things. Okay, so Ooh, this is a tough one. What do you think of this one? Well, you'd have to wonder if they sold it for a certain amount and said, okay, we're we're giving this amount, mm -hmm. but we know that 
such and such an amount is necessary for whatever. It's the same thing that are happening. <laughs> if they had been honest, mm -hmm. it wasn't what they withheld. It wasn't the amount, but it was rather the deceit, you know, mm -hmm. as if God could be mocked, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's the the thing that uh, the power of God was available through the spirit at this time in the church. And what that meant was, is that the power of God, uh, we better have a little bit of healthy fear of God because, you know, God's power can, you know, heal and raise people from the dead. But God's also the God of not just life, but of death as well. And that sin itself leads to death. So this is like a signal to the community that, you know, for most of us, if a kind of sin will incrementally lead to death, but at some point it can also be literally our, our death. So I think it becomes more of a signpost to the to the community, um, but that they lie in the presence of the Holy Spirit, that God can only be in the presence of holiness. And if anything is unholy in that presence, you know, it has to be separate. They can't coexist. And so I think that... Um, some of the mystery of it that doesn't mean that it wholly would make sense to us and if we look at it and say hey that's not fair why didn't god give them a second chance you know why because of their dishonesty where they struck dead you know well actually they got a second chance and it's wonderful you know she could have yeah, right but, she, but they had seen from jesus how he worked you know, right in their eyes i love Mm -hmm. But they're also showing here that the spirit is mighty enough that you're not going to play. Right. Uh, you know, I, you and I both want to be God to show you who he said he is, he wouldn't let us say. Mm -hmm. Well, I think Abraham would question you and he said, well, there's, you know, it's just we don't want to see this side of God. Right. But we think he's loving God. It was a just He's a just God. I think that's the indication is that, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we got everything we deserve, all of us would have this fate happen to us immediately when we sin. So we don't know their eternal fate, though, that being said, but the it was probably for the, just like God raises up, does miracles to bring people back to life for the benefit of the community. God is also doing things to show his power to, you know, get people back on the right path, too. Um that being said, I, I don't, you know, I'm glad we don't live in those times again, you know. Uh, yeah. So too that just because you're giving your money away doesn't mean that you're such a thing and for it. Yeah. They're competing for status here. Mm -hmm. Right. That was going to have an impact on that church. That's a good point. And that, that that we'll look at another person, Simon, who, as I mentioned last week, the word simony, trying to buy a church office, he's named after that. He's another one who tries to do this, and he's struck dead as well. So I think that's a really good point, Christian, is that there's something about trying to mock God. Okay, the point that Christian made is that it wasn't just about the money. It, it was about him trying to use the gift to gain status and power and prestige, and then withholding some to get an upper hand. You know, it was about manipulating the community and trying to manipulate God, you know, when God is not to be mocked. And, you know, and the manipulation could be dangerous to the community. If this person gets into power, what else will they do? What else they will try to manipulate? And how will that else affect the community and affect others? We're also getting back to God's Old Testament. Too. Well, sure. But they're not just a God of the Old Testament and the New Testament. God is a God. All throughout, yeah. That means that doesn't mean we have to like it, though. I I don't know if I still like this passage, but. Yeah. Well, did you like it when you were punished as a child by your parents? Did you try to punish? They like punishment? No. <laughs> right. Still love them. Yes. You understood they wanted to do. Yes. Verse twelve. Uh, in chapter five, now many signs and wonders were done among the people through the apostles, and they were all together in so Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared to join them, but the people held them in high esteem. 
Yet more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, great numbers of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, in order that Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he came by. A great number of people would also gather from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all cured. So, um, God is adding to their number. Who brings the growth to the movement to the church? Is it, God. It's God. Yes. Um, and they're bringing the sick to Peter. This is something we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but the curing, the helping those who are in need, this is the kind of thing that is supposed to be done in the temple and what the temple was intended for. But it's being done among the Christian community, that new temple, in contrast to this old temple that where people are, you know, left in the street and they're not being helped. And all this. So it's illustrating the contrast between the new temple being built through God's people and the old temple, which was intended for that, but it has not been doing what it's supposed to have been doing. Um, so um, people are seeing this, they're taking note. Uh, seventh, verse 17 Then the high priest took action, he and all who were with him. That is the sect of the Sadducees being filled with jealousy, arrested the apostles and put them in public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors, brought them out and said, go stand in the temple and tell the people the whole message about this life. When they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and went on with their teaching. When the high priest and those with him arrived, they called together the council and the whole body of the elders of Israel and set to the prison to have them brought. But when the temple police went there, they did not find them in the prison. So they returned and reported. We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now, when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were perplexed about them, wondering what might be going on. And someone arrived and announced, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. And the captain went with the temple police and brought them, but without violence, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. When they had brought them, they had them stand before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to teach in his name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you are determined to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at the right hand as leader and savior, that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. And we are witnesses to these things. And so it is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill him. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, the teacher of the law, respected by all the people, stood up and ordered the men to be put outside for a short time. Then he said to them, fellow Israelites, consider carefully what you propose to do to these men. For some time ago, Theudas rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. But he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and disappeared. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up at the time of the census and got people to follow him. He also perished. And all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone, because if this plan or this undertaking is of human origin, it will fail. But it, if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. In that case, you may be found fighting against God. They were convinced by him. And when he had called in the apostles, they had him, them flogged. And they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And as they left the council, they rejoiced that they were considered worthy to suffer dishonor for the sake of the name. And every day in the temple and at home, they did not cease to teach and proclaim Jesus as the Messiah. Amen. Amen. Wow. So Gamaliel is, is a true historical figure, was famous of the rabbi, 
most famous of the rabbis at, the, at this time. And he was a teacher of, who was, he, who, was, who was one of Gamaliel's pupils? The Apostle Paul, mm -hmm. later become a pupil of Gamaliel. Mm -hmm. He would be brought, you know, his parents had means to send him from Tarsus to Jerusalem to be instructed in the Torah. And what Gamaliel with them is, is if it is of God, it will continue. If it is not of God, it, will, it won't last. How true it, it, it was, because there were many people in Jesus' day who claimed to be the Messiah. There were a lot of revolts and uprising, but there was only one that we continue to this day, who we continue to lift up and worship. The proof is in the pudding. You know, that uh, the, the church would not have grown this much were it not for the power of God, for the, for the Holy Spirit. So, you know, if we need something to stand on in our faith, just look at what God has done um, throughout history. You know, think about that empires, uh, you know, crumbled because of, you know, the name of Jesus. Or they, or they served under the banner and sign, like Constantine saw the vision of the cross in his dream and nothing was ever the same. You know, the Apostle Paul saw the vision of the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. You know, when, when it time... When it was warranted in history, God intervened because his plan was for the salvation of, of all the world. And it still is. So the uh, question is, is uh, where is the need and when will God intervene next? I, I think almost everyone in the room here, everyone will have a story or many stories of wonderful things that the Lord has done for us and blessed us in. Yes. Which mm. you know, the Lord has done great things for each one of us. Amen. I go off to uh, Trimble Park. Mm -hmm. It's a place of like total silence, and I, I just the, the thankfulness to the Lord builds up within me. Yeah, because it's, it's a peaceful place. And, you know, it, it's kind of like a place of prayer. I never even thought of it that way. Oh yeah. The Lord has done so much for me, and I'm very thankful. I don't deserve anything. I think He also helps us through the rough. He helps us through the rough times. I think that's what this passage indicates as well. You know, they gave thanks for their suffering. They thought it is an honor. Why did they think it was an honor to suffer for the Lord? Because the Lord suffered exactly. Remember, these are the apostles who saw the example of Jesus. And so they thought, wow, anything that could connect us to, you know, what Jesus had done for us, what we had witnessed, it's a privilege. It's an honor. You know, Peter thought so much of what Jesus had done that when it came his time to be crucified, he did not think himself worthy to be crucified right side up. He, he chose to be crucified upside down. You know, that was the power of this witness that they had had. If we saw it too. You know, we would likely feel the same way. You know, our lives would be changed forever. I can remember one time when I was six or nine, I was in the hospital and I'd gone in for three or four days and they couldn't find out what you know. And everyone kept saying, Does this bother you? And I said, No, the minute I left home or I left home, I prayed, God never let me do the past your peace and your presence. And that made it through when they said, you might not go. And I said, well, let me walk into that with your presence. So mm -hmm. I'm not afraid. And the only time in real life, one night, about 10 days in, I woke up and all of a sudden there was fear in the room. And I realized it was coming and I could accept it or not accept it. And there's a man, she's what's the matter? She says, I said, for some reason I'm afraid. She says, now, this is one of the children I told him the other day, and that's all it was. It dawned me my eyes had locked in the door. And it was 22 days before we knew I'd walk out and not be carried out. Them and my father, and they might have been in ICU and all sorts of things. And yeah. it was just both of us were in agreement that we did not know what was coming, but we both had peace because I wanted, if I was going to die, I was demon. Right. And when he told me he was free with it, then, you know, it's just, 
God helps you in the rough levels of grief. He, he does. Yes. Well, I, I'd like to for us to go to a time of prayer. I'm going to release our folks online so we can share our requests. Uh, let's see how I do this. We have a person who's 